have you ever heard of uh, Boswell? He was a biographer, famous biographer of Dr. Samuel Johnson in the 18th century. And if you've done some English literature, you've probably come across him. You know. And Boswell was really a, a very honest man and tried to be very honest about his own weaknesses. And uh, he wrote a diary, of course, and this is the entry for Sunday, November the 28th. 1762. I went to St. James's Church and heard service and a good sermon on By what means shall a young man learn to order his ways? In which the advantages of early piety were well displayed. What a curious, inconsistent thing is the mind of man. In the midst of divine service, I was laying plans for having women, and yet I had the most sincere feelings of religion. Now, that's the problem that we've been talking about. Where you are supposedly thinking the most holy thoughts, and yet you find there's another part of you deep down that is thinking the most unholy thoughts. Now, uh, Dostoevsky uh, talked about the whole, the same thing throughout all his novels, you know. And he described it this way. He said, A man will talk to you with excitement and passion of the true normal interests of man. With irony, he will upbraid the short-sighted fools who do not understand their own interests, nor the true significance of virtue. And within a quarter of an hour, without any sudden outside provocation, but simply through something inside him which is stronger than all his interests, he will go off on quite a different task. That is, act in direct opposition to what he has just been saying about himself. In opposition to the laws of reason, in opposition to his own advantage, in fact, in opposition to everything. Now, dear ones, I don't think there's one of us here in the theatre who would not admit that, yeah, we know that feeling. And we've had it inside. And part of the popularity of the story of Dr. Jekyll uh, and Mr. Hyde is just that. That it seems that inside each of us there seems to be a Hyde. And we have real problems being consistent and maintaining what we believe is right for our lives. What do the psychologists call it? Nowadays the psychologists are so baffled that they admit there is just a perversity in human nature that they cannot explain. And they have at last got to that point. There was a time in the heyday of optimism when they thought they could explain it. Now they say, no, there's just a perversity in man that we cannot explain. The, this Bible really does tie it down a lot better. you know, And it puts it into a definite category. If you, if you look at it in James 4 and 17. James 4 and 17, it describes that situation exactly, you know, that we've been talking about. James 4 and 17. It's page 1056, 1056. James 4 and 17. Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, that's the situation, you see. Boswell is sitting listening to the sermon, and he knows that he ought to be thinking pure thoughts. Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So, the Bible calls that kind of thing sin. That force inside us that prevents us doing the best that we want to do, that's called sin. Now, I think we need to see that that's sin. And we need to get rid of all the brainwashing that we've had because we tend to say, oh, drinking is a sin or hopping into bed with someone who isn't your wife, that's a sin. Now, those are sinful acts. You know, I agree with you. But do you see that the heart of the problem is sin? It's the force inside you that you can't control. See, I think often we think God is just trying to torture us by saying, oh, sin, sin, sin. God is trying to show you that sin is the force inside you that you can't control. 
God is not an unkind God. He doesn't just give a name to an outward act that you know fine well is wrong. He gives the name to the inward force that prevents you being what you want. And he's trying to show you that there is an answer to it by categorizing it. Now, you can see that it's explained again in Romans 7 and 20. And you'll see it's exactly the same experience, really. Romans 7 and 20. And page 982. 982. In Romans 7 and 20. First of all, you see, it's whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it for him it is sin. Then he explains it a different way through Paul in verse 20 of 7. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. And God takes us another step and says, this sin is almost like a different person inside you. It's something almost that you cannot control. It's a supernatural force. Now, what do most of us do? Oh, we struggle and struggle and struggle and try and try and try again. That's what we do. We try to overcome that force. We know fine well that we're only accepted by God because of Jesus' death. And we're not accepted by God because of all the good works we do. So it's interesting. We don't try to get God to accept us because of our good works. Yet, that's the very thing we try to do to eliminate this evil inside us. We try good works. We try self-effort and strain and New Year resolutions. In other words, we're ready to believe that we're justified before God by faith and not by works. But the tragedy is, most of us try to be sanctified by works. Now that's the real problem, brothers and sisters. That's why there are so many hypocritical, defeated Christians around. Because many of us are prepared to believe that God accepts us only because of what he's done in Jesus. But now we're accepted, we believe that we can become like him just by our own self-effort, and we cannot. And God is trying to point out to us, there is an answer for this evil force within us. Now, of course, most of us haven't found that answer at all. Uh, It shows itself in our lives as a kind of independence. Someone wrongs you at home, or in the office, or at school. They wrong you. Uh, They treat you absolutely unfairly and unjustly. And you know that you should depend on the life that flows from God to deal with them. That's that's what he says plainly. Luke 6, if you like to look at it. Luke chapter 6 says that. And verses 27 through 36. Luke 6 and 27. Or it can be the neighbor, you know, the neighbor over the fence or or the neighbor in the dorm that does something against you and you know you should take a certain attitude to them and let God's life deal with them. But you work independently of God's life. But I say to you that here, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your coat as well. Give to everyone who begs from you. And of him who takes away your goods, do not ask them again. And as you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. But but be merciful even as your Father is merciful. And you know, you come into that situation and you know fine well, that's what I should do. That's what I should be like. And yet you know fine well, brothers and sisters, We decide we're going to live independent of whatever life God puts forth to deal with that. And we know in our hearts that his Holy Spirit will deal with the person if we simply love them. But we determine we'll go independent of that. And we decide we'll use our own weapons of resentment and sarcasm and criticism and hardness and unkindness. And you know that all that stuff just flows out against the person. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if it's a person next door to us who has dealt with us unkindly or unjustly, doesn't matter if it's a relative, 
that has been unfair to us. We know that we should love them and let God's life deal with them, but we live independent of his life. We decide we'll deal with it our own way. In actual fact, what we're doing is saying, that God up there doesn't know how to deal with this situation. But I do know how to deal with it. And I am God in this situation. And I'm going to make it the way I want it. And I'm going to make it in my image, by my own force and by my own power. And really, that's what we do. Now, dear ones, that's sin. That whole attitude that wants to put a wrong right by our own power instead of loving the other person. And you know, I mean, we are mad people. We live with roots of bitterness within us over this, don't we? I, it would be interesting to find out how many of you have still got a root of bitterness against somebody. You know? Dear mums and dads, how often we've had roots of bitterness against the kids because they wouldn't do as we said. And we've never really forgiven them. And us, you know, who are sons and daughters, how often we've had a root of bitterness against the mum and dad because of some attitude that took years ago and we've long ago overcome the disadvantage, but we still have a root of bitterness against them. It's that old attitude, you see, of wanting to put the thing right by our own power, by our own sarcasm, by our own resentment. Now, Jesus was not like that. That's the amazing thing. Almost every one of us is like that. But he wasn't like that. Now, look at him in Mark 15. It is. Mark 15. And you see just a, a harrowing, provocative situation here. Mark 15 and 29, verse 29. It's page 885, 885. And verse 29 of Mark 15. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. You see, you must remember, the ones, that Jesus said at another time when he was telling Peter, you remember, to put away a sword, I could call millions of angels to my aid. And so he could have done it this time. While they were jibing him and saying, if you were a real God, you'd come down from the cross. So also the chief priests mocked him to one another with the scribes, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Yet he held back from calling the angels to his aid. He held back from doing anything that would extricate him from the difficult situation. He trusted that God could even raise him from the dead, if necessary, with God's own life. And no one, you can see that this Jesus had an ability, under the most provocative situations, to stay steady and just hold to the trust that his God would deliver him. Now, do one, the only way you and I can experience the same victory is in having Jesus really inside us completely. The only way you can ever come into that same victory is to come into a real death with him, to that right you have to deal with a difficult situation by sarcasm or by resentment or by criticism or by backbiting. And that's what he did. I mean, he obviously came to a place where he said, Lord, I do not care what they do to me. I don't care how they jibe. I don't care how they jeer. I am going to stay steady and love them and let you deal with them. And obviously he died to any right he had to call angels, archangels, to call anger, resentment, criticism, sarcasm to his aid. Now, brothers and sisters, when you come into dying to those things with Jesus, then you'll find that that amazing love inside him will begin to come out from you when you come into those situations. Now, really, it's true. But it's only in Christ that it happens. It's only in Jesus. You need a power greater than yourself that can produce that love. Now, it is produced if you really cleave to Jesus. That's why so much of Christianity just gets back to that. It means embracing Jesus. It means pulling this person inside you and letting everything that is not like him be expelled on the cross. And that can be yours. 
So it doesn't matter who has the, a, a terrible anger or a terrible resentment or a terrible bitterness here today. If you are willing to die with Jesus to your right to deal with that difficult situation yourself and instead trust God to do it, you'll find that God will not only deal with the situation, but Jesus will bring forth in you an incredible love. Now don't you see that that's what the world wants to see? The world sees plenty of people being kind to each other. But the world sees very little of people being kind to people who are unkind to them. And that's what makes the difference. But it requires a real death, you know. Dear husbands and wives, I mean, we're at it too, aren't we? In silly little ways, you know. We think we'll put her right or we'll put him right. We don't put them right. We just mess it up all, all the more, really. And it's the same in every home situation. If we would shut up and let God deal with the situation. But don't you see that requires a real death to our independence of God's life and our substituting our own method. Uh, just another obvious place, you know. You see it in regard to our status with other people. We're full of ideas of our rights, aren't we? We're very full of our rights, you know. What we have a right to expect from someone else in the way of respect. What we have a right to expect from someone else because they're a friend. We have a tremendous series of demands that we put on everybody. We feel, well, we have a right to expect certain things from our mother, a right to expect certain things from our father, and he's always a bad father if he doesn't give us those. And we have a right to expect certain things from our children. And we have a right to expect certain things from our friends, and from our girlfriends, and from our teacher, and from our pastor. And really, our whole life is bound not so much by the things that they ought to get from us, but by the things that we think we have a right to get from them. Uh, we talk a lot uh, about Nixon's political debts. And we all know that because of the system that we have, uh, his coming to power involved incurring many political debts to all kinds of groups and all kinds of interests. And he has spent uh, uh, maybe too much of his time paying off those political debts. Our tragedy is we don't spend our time paying off debts to other people. We spend time counting up the debts that they owe us. And you know it. If the wife doesn't behave in a certain way, you get resentful. You expect it from her. If the friend doesn't come up in a certain way in a time of difficulty, you get resentful. He's not being a true friend. We expect things from each other. And it's as if we're gods, you know, and we have the right to receive all kinds of things from all the poor little minions that surround us in our life. And isn't it true that a lot of our resentment comes because they don't come through, you know. And we really bind them. We bind them and we bind ourselves. Uh, we don't get a certain uh, vacation that we think the friend should give us or our parents should give us. And the old root of bitterness comes up inside and we feel they haven't paid us what they owe us. Now, brothers and sisters, do you see that lets loose a force of resentment? And what, of course, we're actually doing is we're asking too much from the world. That's really it. You know? We're really being utterly unfair to each other. We demand love and attention from our wives and husbands and brothers and sisters and friends that, dear love them, they couldn't give if they were the most loving people in the world. We're demanding superhuman things from a world. You know. We demand tremendous excitement and exhilaration either from sex or from the motorbike. You know. But something exciting. We're demanding incredible stimulation and exhilaration from poor things that can't give it to us. And that's a force of sin inside us. Now, Jesus himself, you know, was free from that. And you can see it if you, if you look in John 13. He just did not have this attitude, you know, that he was master of everything and that everybody should give things to him. 
He was not continually de defending that position. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and girded himself with a towel. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And verse 12, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And this man obviously did not take that attitude, that they owed respect to him and they owed uh, love to him and service to him. He obviously didn't feel that anybody owed him anything. Now, dear ones, do you see that that's the only way to come into victory, to live that way? Now, the reason why we have long wars of attrition on this is we decide, well, we'll do it gradually. We'll do it gradually. We'll gradually get over the idea that people owe us things and we'll begin to give to others. Loved ones, it'll never come about. You'll never get rid of the resentment and bitterness that way. It can only come the way it came with Jesus. If you look at Romans 6 and 10, the verse you know that we're studying today, Romans 6 and 10. It's page 981. The death he died, he died to sin. That is the sin of that independence or the sin of these rights that we feel we have. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now do you see the three words, once for all? The only way to come into victory over that attitude is to be willing to die with Jesus to our rights to have anything from anybody. Now that's it, really. Really, brothers and sisters. It needs a crisis experience or crisis decision. It's no use saying, oh well, I'll keep on expecting things from my mother because that's fair enough. I mean, after all, she has Mother's Day and we give her presents and all that kind of thing, so we ought to get things from our mother and I'll try to ease off demanding things from my friends. No. It has to be a death to your right to expect anything from anybody. And the only way to do that is to come into the death that we suffered in Jesus. You see, in fact, God destroyed it all in Jesus. And once you're dead, you can't really look around expecting too much. Because corpses don't take, drink too many sodas and they don't ride too many motorbikes. And when you come into a place where you're willing to be crucified with Jesus and you say, yes, Lord, I see that what you did was destroy me in Jesus, then suddenly you're free from all this business of having rights and demanding things from people. And it is a miracle, you know. And you find instead that Jesus lives his life through you and begins to look to God for everything. It's a great thing for a husband and wife in bed together when the husband is receiving from the father all the love that he needs, then it's a beautiful experience. Because suddenly he's not trying to get love from his wife. He's able to give her love. It's great when two friends in a dorm, when they look to God for all the encouragement and help that they need in their examinations, and then the night before the examination, they aren't demanding these notes from each other, or they aren't feeling resentful against the other person for not giving them this kind of help. There's a great freedom comes when you really are willing to die with Jesus to getting things from the world and from other people, and are prepared to live to God alone. And dear ones, I find my own life anyway, that it, it required a crisis time, when I really did decide, you know, all right, Father, this I'm not going to do anymore. Just one little thing that I'd like you to look at for a moment. How many of us have expressed it in a different way? 
We've lost our temper because the car wouldn't start at 30 above. 30 above. If it won't start at 30 above, what's the point of having it? It wouldn't start and the temper goes. Or we're on the way out of the house and we have to meet that person in 10 minutes flat and the button comes off the coat, you know. And that's not the moment for it. Or the vacation falls through, just falls absolutely through and we were looking forward to it so much. Or the job doesn't come through that we were fully expecting. How many of us in that situation have found rising up within us a resistance and a rebellion against the events that are taking place? And we feel this isn't fair. That's the old sin. God in his goodness has allowed these things to happen. He knows that there's something inside us to be dealt with. But we don't see it that way at all. We don't see it from his point of view. We just resist completely, not only as ideal will, but as permissive will in this situation. And there rises up within us a tremendous resentment. And you know we take it out on everybody. We take it out on anybody that's anywhere nearby. We feel that they're responsible, the world's responsible, but it's all treating me unfairly. Now, loved ones, that's sin, you see. Now, you find that Jesus was just absolutely free of it, you know. Uh, Matthew 26 and 39 to 46. Whatever God planned for him ideally or permitted to come to him, he was willing to receive. Matthew 26 and verse 39. And it wasn't that it was all easy, you see, or automatic. You can see this in, in, in this chapter. Matthew 26 and 39 is page 862. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So he, he certainly considered the thing. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you watch, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, thy will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking a rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And you know, no resentment about it. Lord, if it's possible for it to happen another way, uh, it would be good. But if it's not, then, okay, let's go and meet it. And an entirely different attitude towards unexpected events, you know. An entirely different attitude towards things that weren't convenient for him. Now, brothers and sisters, do you see that the only way to come clear of that resentment that bounds up inside us is to enter into Jesus in his death to what he thinks of the things that are happening. It's not fatalism. Fatalism is giving up any hope that you'll ever understand what's happening and just succumbing to it. But this is rather an embracing of the thing, saying, Father, I don't know what this means at this moment, but I trust you that you are in charge of it and that you're weaving in even this unexpected accident into your plan to conform me to your image. So, Father, I accept it and embrace it. And it's a real dying to your right to understand everything that happens to you the moment it happens. And instead, of course, a real living on to God. A real dying to that sin of resisting the events that God allows to come to you and a real living on to God in the midst of those events. You see what it means. It means that a person who has died with Jesus to that right to understand every event can meet every event with real joy and peace, even the ones he doesn't understand. So a person who is in Jesus, who has died to self in that way, is utterly victorious all the time, even in the midst of cancer even in the midst of a relative dying, even in the midst of a job falling through, that person is dead to that resistance to those events. He's not a little God struggling with the God in heaven saying, this shouldn't happen this way, I'm going to make it happen another way. But he is a creature saying, well, Father, I don't understand it, but I know you know what the purpose of it is, and I trust you, Lord. 
And I know that you're going to work it out right anyway. Now, dear ones, all those freedoms can only come in Jesus. That's it. Don't. I've explained some of the mental machinations that take place within, you know. But the actual dynamic for being freed from that sin of independence of God's life, that sin of insisting on your own rights and demanding from people all the time, that sin of resisting the events that happen to you, freedom from that kind of sin can only come in Jesus. Really what I'm saying to you is, you really need to embrace Jesus. Cleave close to him. Say, Lord Jesus, I want you to live that kind of life through me again. Show me what I have to die to for you to do that. And then once Jesus will begin to show you through the Holy Spirit. And you'll begin to enter a, just a victorious life. It is. It's just an incredibly victorious life. You, know? you can't lose much after you're dead. You know, you really can't. What does it matter what they do? And that's it. It's a beautiful experience of having died to what you expect from this world, and yet finding yourself, I'm still in it. And yet I'm not demanding a whole lot of things from it. I'm trusting God for everything I need. It's really good. You know. It's a different way to go. Let us pray. Dear Father, we know that this is what you want us to do. We know, Father, that you want us to see plainly that you destroyed us all in Jesus, that we were all crucified with Christ 1,900 years ago, that we were just such a bad lot that all you could do was destroy us and finish us. And that our freedom is found in accepting that and allowing you through the Holy Spirit to live whatever kind of life you want through us. And Lord Jesus, we know that it's your kind of life that the Holy Spirit will live through us. And so we thank you that we can get insight into what we have to die to by looking at your own life and seeing what you died to. Lord Jesus, we see that you died to any right to expect anything from your friends. You died to any right to feel resentment against you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died to any right to call legions of angels or call sarcasm or criticism to your aid. You died to the right, Lord Jesus, to have events go the way you wanted them to. And, O oh Lord, we trust you to show each one of us how we can come into that death too and into the victory that you have where you live to God alone. Lord, we trust you to show us through the Holy Spirit that we may live victoriously for your glory. Amen.